this week on Vaticano, Pope Francis undergoes surgery at Rome's Agostino Gemelli University Hospital. Stay with us to visit Cardinal Joseph Mincenti's prison cell in Budapest, Hungary, and learn about how Padre Pio bilocated with bread and wine to celebrate the Holy Mass with the Cardinal. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis was admitted to Agostino Gemelli University Polyclinic Hospital for a scheduled surgery on July the 4th. The Holy Father was suffering from a common colon problem called diverticular stenosis. This is the same hospital where St. John Paul II was treated after he was shot on May the 13th, 1981. I wish him the best because he is a pope who deserves it. I think he is one of the best popes in recent times. And so I wish him to heal very soon and that he will not have the consequences after the operation. Claudio, together with other Romans treated in the hospital, wish the Holy Father good health. It's not only Romans who are concerned about the pope's health. Drieda, a lead medical researcher from Albania, says she received calls from Albanians who were worried about him. Well, it's actually an honor to be working at the same structure that is taking care of uh, Pope Francis. Uh, I'm actually from Albania and several people from Albania have been writing me and asking if everything is fine, how is he doing, how is the, uh, the situation. And uh, we were all, I think, relieved when we got to know that uh, he's doing fine, that the intervention was a success and uh, he will be getting out of the hospital soon. On July the 11th, Pope Francis prayed the Sunday Angelus from a window at the hospital with fellow patients at his side on his feet again, and seen for the first time in public, seven days after the operation. Cari fratelli e sorelle, il prossimo incontro mondiale delle famiglie. The Holy Father recorded a video message explaining the special new format for the upcoming World Meeting of Families. The event will be centered in Rome, but Pope Francis is encouraging dioceses around the world to get involved. It will be an opportunity, provided by Providence, to create a worldwide event that can involve all the families that would like to feel part of the ecclesial community. The goal of the meeting is to create a sense of fraternity between families everywhere and the Church in Rome. The 10th World Meeting of Families will be held in Rome from June the 22nd to the 26th, 2022. Pope Francis will can celebrate the closing mass of the 52nd Eucharistic Congress this September in Budapest, Hungary, and then make a three-day pastoral trip to Slovakia. He officially announced the upcoming trip during his Angelus address on July the 4th. I am happy to announce that from the next 12th to 15th September, God willing, I will travel to Slovakia to make a pastoral visit. The Slovaks there are happy. In the afternoon, first, I will celebrate the concluding Mass of the International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest. The Cardinal Primate of Hungary, Peter Erdo, says that Hungarians are very happy to welcome the Holy Father for the Eucharistic Congress and they're rejoicing together with the neighboring Slovaks. Regarding religious life in Slovakia, that is, we are one heart. Our diocese and Slovakia was one reality for a long time, for more than 800 years. So for us, it is also a feast. Pope Francis is planning to visit the cities of Bratislava, Preshov, and Košice. 
and he will likely visit the Shrine of Our Lady of Sorrows in Shashtin on her September the 15th feast day. È uno dei santuari più importanti di tutta la regione. Sastin Sanctuary is one of the most important in the region. It was born like this. A Hungarian count quarreled with his wife and then threw her out of the carriage. And from this inhuman gesture, he then had remorse of conscience. They made peace in the family and then he founded this place of devotion. So it is a place where you can pray very well for families and for couples. So it's a very current message. After the break, we travel to Budapest, Hungary to visit Venerable Cardinal Joseph Mincenti's prison cell to learn about a miracle that happened there. Budapest is preparing to receive thousands of pilgrims for the International Eucharistic Congress there in September. Preparations are almost complete already at the Cardinal Joseph Mincenti Square. The statue of Cardinal Mincenti marks the front of the building that used to be his prison. The Cardinal suffered much for his faith at the hands of both the Nazis and the Communists. Now this square is a monument to Cardinal Mincenti's heroic resilience. Gergely Kovac, vice postulator and promoter of the Cardinal's beatification cause, walks us through the prison which still has the same look as when the Cardinal was imprisoned there. This is the first floor corridor of the former prison of the Communist Party's State Security Authority on Conti Street. There are cells beginning with number one, like 101, 102, 103, 104, etc. And this is an important place because Cardinal Mincinti was first brought here when he arrived in 1949 to this secret prison, which is the site of his secret detention. Gergely says that Cardinal Mincinti lived in almost every one of these cells. Moving around the prisoners was a tool of psychological torture. This is why in his memoirs, the Cardinal calls this place my penitentiary. Here, at certain stages of detention, seven people were staying at the same time in the same cell, and they could not even go to bed, all seven of them at once, unless they took turns. They slept on a straw bag, and it was a dirty, filthy blanket that they could and had to cover themselves with. After turning off the lights, they could only lie on the hard, concrete bed at night. There was no heating for a long time, so they had to freeze. But they weren't allowed to keep their hands under the blankets. If they weren't visible, they were woken up by the guards. Gergely says that there was a lot of suffering happening in this prison building, but there were also a lot of heroic prayers, and even a miracle took place here. Between September 1949 and June 1950, the Cardinal was not allowed to celebrate Mass in this prison on Conti Street for nine months, and it was a huge spiritual torment for him. 
és ez neki óriási lelki kint jelentett. But one night Padre Pio bilocated to this cell with bread and wine and celebrated mass together with Cardinal Mincenti. That's why it was a huge gift that one day Padre Pio came and they celebrated the Holy Mass together. This event gave strength to Cardinal Mincenti, who after spending eight years in prison, underwent house arrest. He was freed in 1956 during the popular uprising, but then had to take refuge in the United States Embassy in Budapest. He lived there for the next 15 years. At the end of his life, he was exiled from Hungary to Austria, where he died in Vienna on May the 6th, 1975. This year, on the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, on Saturday, June the 12th, Monsignor Ferenc Serhati, Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Estergom, Budapest, celebrated a Holy Mass to implore the beatification of the Venerable Cardinal Joseph Mincenti. Cardinal Mincenti's love for the Eucharist was iconic. This is why he's one of the patrons of the upcoming Eucharistic Congress. Let us recognize that there's no other way to come to the dawn than by passing through the night. And in the night of crisis, all of us need to remain united. Unity was the Holy Father's main message to Christian leaders from Lebanon, who spent the day at the Vatican to pray and discuss the future of their country. Representatives from Lebanon's Maronite, Greek Melkite, Greek Orthodox, Syriac Orthodox, Chaldean Catholic, Syriac Catholic, and Evangelical communities came to the Vatican on July the 1st for a day of prayer. Father George Breidi, a Lebanese priest and director of Radio Miriam, says that this event brought hope and light to the Lebanese. Tutti gli Ibanesi. All the Lebanese were in front of both social media and TV to see and hear the Holy Father. They felt his great affection towards them. The great message that the Pope sent to the Lebanese is not to lose hope. Not to lose hope because after the darkness, there is a light. The Holy Father also asked the politicians of Lebanon to leave away their personal interests for the sake of the people. After the devastating explosion in Beirut's port in August of last year, Lebanese politicians have failed to form a government. The explosion killed nearly 200 people, injured 600, and left many without shelter. First of all, I ask for prayer, which is a great support. And I ask those who can really help to provide help. Because now in Lebanon, there is a great lack of milk for children and of food for many. Many poor families cannot find anything to eat because of the economic crisis. After the explosion in Beirut, until now, many people have no home to live in. They need help and there is no one for them. So how can we help? First, we have to feel that we are one family. We are all brothers, as Pope Francis always says. And also to think about this brother who needs my help. 
che ha bisogno del mio aiuto e del nostro aiuto. In questi tempi di sventura... In these woeful times, we want to affirm with all of our strength that Lebanon is and must remain a project of peace. Its vocation is to be a land of tolerance and pluralism, an oasis of fraternity where different religions and confessions meet, where different communities live together, putting the common good before their individual interests. Anteponendo il bene comune ai vantaggi particolari. Forse tutti i libanesi hanno messo sul loro... One of the pictures that maybe all the Lebanese put on their social profiles was this image of Pope Francis kissing the icon that the Byzantine patriarch carried. And this is the image of the holy, one Christ-founded church. And this gathering of the whole church together for Lebanon touched us a lot. Because the Lebanese saw that the church carries their cry, carries their cries to the Lord. Like that woman, as Pope Francis mentioned, that woman from Sidon, from Tyre, in southern Lebanon, who went to Jesus to ask him for help. Lord, help me. Even today, there is the cry of the Lebanese. Lord, help us. Lord, help us to find life again. Signore, aiutaci. Signore, aiutaci a trovare la vita di nuovo. Ci siamo riuniti oggi. We assembled today to pray and reflect, impelled by our deep concern for Lebanon, a country very close to my heart and which I wish to visit, as we see it plunged into a serious crisis. Precipitato in una grave crisi. The visit of Pope Francis is what perhaps almost all Lebanese are waiting for. Because as the Pope said in his return from Iraq, that he has this great desire that his next apostolic visit will be in Lebanon. Today, there is a big political crisis Many demonstrations happen almost every day, so there is no security for such a visit. However, we know well that such a trip will definitely bring peace for this land, which we need very, very much. Pope Francis concluded the prayer asking God that the hostilities may cease, disagreements fade away, and that Lebanon may once more radiate the light of peace. Stay with us. After the break, you'll get a rare look into the life of a pontifical Swiss guard. John Andrea Bossi is 20 years old and from Davos in Switzerland, and he is one of the newest members of the Pontifical Swiss Guard, protecting the Pope and the Vatican. When did you first ever think of becoming a Swiss Guard? The first time was about three years ago when I was in Rome. Uh, we were here with a group of uh, young Catholic people. I saw the Swiss Guards and I began to think about it. What was it about them that you thought, I think I would like to do that? First of all, it's to serve in the Catholic Church, I think, and to see them standing there, it's like, it's an honor to stand there, to, to do your service for the Church, for the Pope, and I also like, like the uniform, <laughs> yeah. for sure, yes. <laughs> they stand out, <laughs> yeah. it's hard to miss them. And back in Switzerland, you went to university? No, I went to school and after school I worked as a lumberjack. Oh wow. Yes. So in forestry? Yes. 
John Andrea grew up in a Catholic family, and as he grew older, his faith really started to develop. I always searched for the truth. I always believed that there is something more than just humans, and so I started going to the church more, started reading the Bible, and my favorite thing, the rosary. I started praying the rosary. Really? Yes. What was it about the rosary that you really liked? I don't know, it was the repetition of, of the Ave Marias and thinking about the life of Jesus and I prayed it in moments where I was sad or where I was happy and it was always like it gave me th something that I'd say that this world can't give. What did your friends think when you would tell them that you know you, you liked being a Catholic and that you liked praying the rosary and then that you were thinking of becoming a Swiss guard? Uh, that's a good thing about where I, in the town where I live. We have a, a good priest, a good Catholic priest. And so a lot of my friends also went, went to church with me and prayed with me. And so it was, for a few friends, was like, yeah, what, what, are, you, what are they doing? <laughs> and they didn't get it. But with my best friends, I would say, we always went together to church. We prayed together. So it was never a problem. John Andrea took a break from his work as a lumberjack and joined the military in Switzerland, where he underwent rigorous training. And that's when he applied and was selected to become a Swiss Guard. I like serving. Like, I like the military, like the, you were in with, with your comrades and the military life, I like it. And You like the structure? Yes, I like the structure, that's it. And the discipline? Yes, and also the uniform, I like wearing it, I like serving and that's was becoming a Swiss guard was the first, th first thing I thought about and it's like you can surf so you, you can work but you can also pray. And on the 6th of May John Andrea was one of 34 young men who were sworn in as new Swiss guards at a special ceremony at the Vatican. What was that moment like when you were sworn in as a Swiss guard? I will never forget about that moment. That moment it's, it, was, it was great was a, a wave of emotions and I can't, I can't even describe it. I, I don't have the words for it, but it was a great moment. It was also a little bit of an honor to swear in, yes. And you held the flag? Yes. What does that symbolize or what does that mean? Oh, it's, it's in that moment where you swear to God or you swear for, this, for the Swiss gods that you will give your life for the Pope, for, in, for your faith, and to serve as a Swiss God, to serve the Catholic Church, and to serve God, and it's, I can't describe the feeling, it's, it's great, it's, I can't describe it. <laughs> His parents were present on the day too, and were immensely proud. There's no words to describe that feeling. I, it, it's just great, and it's a, a big honor to be here. I'm very proud father and uh, yeah, I'm just enjoying uh, the day. John Andrea will now spend the next two years serving in the world's oldest military, protecting the Pope and the Vatican. But even beyond that, he wants to continue to be of service to the Catholic Church. I want to stay in the church and I want to serve it to the end of my life. I hope I will serve until my last day.